Hello, everyone. Welcome to the FCC Task Force Educational Webinar. Thank you, Carolyn, for this amazing music. And I'm just upbeat now. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to see many familiar faces and names. And thanks for joining. And we have a three excellent speakers lined up. So let's start our webinar on time. Um, this webinar is in conjunction with the California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative called CPQCC. Um, as a part of the post um, improvement Palosa, um, Ashwini, um, Courtney, and Janine uh, from CPQCC Educational Committee will share their uh, post improvement Palosa activity at the end. Next slide. So I will introduce myself. I'm Malati, Stanford neonatologist, spearheading this FFCC task force, along with my co-chair, Colby, a neonatologist from um, University of Rochester, and Carolyn, um, CPQCC program manager, is a program manager for this task force um, as well. And Carolyn is keeping us all are well organized, and she formatted this slide deck for today's webinar. And I don't know what I would do without you, Carolyn. Thank you for doing this. And we are so thrilled to be here. Um, next slide. This slide acknowledges a few of our partners helping us build this FCC community. And thank you for that support. And next slide. So our agenda is listed on this slide and we will share our task force and small group QI update briefly followed by CPQCC Family Advisory Council um, update, and then speaker's presentation, um, but then we end with the question and answer session. Um, question and answer session will be moderated by CPQCC Educational Committee Chair Ashwini and Associate Director of Quality, uh, Courtney. Please post your questions in the chat, and if we can get your answer during this talk, and we will try our best to gather the responses from our family partners and speakers, um, so I'll share them with you all in our listserv. And next slide. This slide shows our journey so far um, and our aim statement. And as you can read, um, the, our aim is to educate and create guidelines and facilitate unit-based FCC interventions in the NICU. We started the task force work in November of 2021 by recruiting passionate providers and family partners. In phase two, we created a networking opportunities for NICUs interested in FCC. The primary challenge with the FCC is changing the mindset of the healthcare providers to view families as an essential part of the healthcare team. So we are doing these educational webinars. Um, so today's webinar is the third out of eight webinar series, and we share the recording uh, widely on our social media platforms and share it on our listserv. And you will hear more about this from Carolyn about our Padlet um, a link. So if you are interested, wants to share this information with your staff, um, you can feel free to share the um, recording. And phase three is we are facilitating uh, five small groups um, and centers to build the Family Center Care Committee and Family Partnership Council. Next slide. To promote family-centered care, we must partner with families uh, from the program inception. So this slide shows our 15 amazing family partners, and we are adding more into our family partner list, uh, which is um, fantastic. And uh, I'm so excited and uh, so honored to work with a uh, partner with the, all of those family partners. Next slide. Um, this slide shows our new executive council members, and Emily is a neonatologist, um, she's co-leading um, group four, and Lori is a chief executive officer of Sinova Associates Advancing Nurse Leadership um, Community. And uh, we have Elizabeth and Morgan, they are family partner for small group one and three. And thank you for joining um, our task force and welcome. Next slide. So we have two subcommittees so far. So our newsletter committee led by Vargabi. And so this we plan to publish a quarterly newsletter focusing on the latest FCC publication and family partners expert insights. Um, this is a screenshot of our inaugural um, newsletter dedicated to our family partner speakers and their expert insights. We share this with our listserv members and we will post the link in the chat too. So 
those words are very powerful. So please share them with your bedside providers to change the unit culture. Um, next slide. Another subcommittee is a communication and marketing and Daphna is the chair and she's spearheading the com um, Twitter communication. This is the screenshot of our Twitter page and follow us on Twitter if you are on Twitter and um, so we can expand the, uh, our mission. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, phase three focuses on facilitating the center to build FCC committee and family partnership council. This slide is busy. I'm not expecting you to read this, um, but this slide shows the name of 34 centers and members who committed to making a change. Um, I appreciate their commitment. They filled out the baseline 20 question contact survey. I will share two questions results uh, pertaining to today's talk. We want to ask you all the same two questions um, by poll. Um, so you, the poll will show up on your Zoom window. You can answer the questions and we will share the results before the speaker's presentation. Thank you for doing that. Um, so the next slide, and this, this slide shows um, our first question um, of the Pareto chart shows that Y-axis is the number of responses and X-axis shows the answers um, to whether they have a family-centered care committee or not in their unit. So we have a 34 centers responded to this survey and 17 out of 34, they don't have any family-centered care committee. And 12, um, they have some, um, they, they have a committee, but it's somewhat active and there's a way for them to improve. And five, they have a very active um, FCC committee. But we define the FCC committee as a multidisciplinary team um, participating from family partners and, and uh, staff nurses and therapists and physician. Um, next slide, please. This slide shows our second question is that this Pareto chart shows that Y axis is number of responses and X axis is their um, answers. And as you can see, 14 out of 34 centers that do not have a family partnership council and 13, they have a family partnership council. It's somewhat active. And there's room for improvement. And four, they have a very active um, uh, family partnership council, which is great. Next slide, please. So based on our survey responses, we created our SMART aims for the small group. Um, so this slide shows our SMART aims. Um, so we wanted to in increase the percentage of NICUs who have a very active family-centered care committee and very active family partnership council. Um, next slide, please. We asked them about what the barriers are to implementing the family-centered care committee. And they can choose multiple options. That's why you have a more responses here, like 198 responses. Um, so the top barrier listed here is lack of staff time and followed by culture change and lack of parents' presence at the bedside. So we are oh, we hope to remove the culture change barriers by through this webinar. Um, um, so that's our um, goal, um, um, having this every other month webinars. Thank you. Next slide. So we have a fantastic team of neonatologists and family partners leading the small groups and helping the team to build um, FCC and uh, uh, Family Partnership Council. Next slide. So we are so thankful for their commitment and without their help, we won't be able to initiate this project. Thank you. And next slide. Also, I want to thank our QA mentors for their um, advice in our QA collaborative work. And now I will hand over the virtual mic to Caroline uh, for her to share her CPQCC work and task force members. Thank you. Thanks, Malati. Um, we are so excited that we have over 300 people who are now part of this task force listserv. Um, and those folks represent over 90 different hospitals. This is extremely exciting. We've gained a lot of momentum over the past couple of months for this work. Um, so thank you for sharing those um, emails and links. We really appreciate it. And we're excited to see so many of you here today. Um, in case you were interested in past webinar resources or future webinar topics, you can scan that QR code right there. I'll also drop the link in the chat. Um, so this is a link to our Padlet. Uh, so this is your sort of you know, go-to spot um, for all the different recordings, um, for some notes, for some transcripts. Um, that's in the chat as well if you prefer that. 
Malati also asked me to talk about an initiative that the California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative, CPQCC, um, that we are working on as well. Um, so as some of you may be aware, only a third of California NICUs have a family advisor or family partnership council, and less than that actually formally involve families in their QI work. Despite all of the developmental outcomes that we know depend on family involvement and the abilities of families to really shape structures and systems of care for infants. So with that knowledge in mind, we are really excited to say that we are launching a statewide family advisory council for CPQCC that will not only advise our activities for QI, for research and data, but that we also hope will act as a catalyst for that local NICU family advisory um, council and family partnership work. Because California is such a diverse state, we really want to represent that in our council uh, in terms of language of preference, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic factors. Uh, that's pretty. Uh, that's a really critical factor for us in this venture. We also hope that this group will curate. There's a lot of good resources like this webinar already out there, um, but to curate it and create some educational resources for NICUs. How do you get started? How do you sustain membership? How do you support family advisory council members, um, because that's it's a long-term game. It's not just a, a one and done project. We're excited to also offer mini grants to California NICUs. If financial burdens are, are the biggest barrier to get this project started, um, we know $5,000 isn't a lot in the scheme of things, um, but maybe it'll help you know you be able to compensate your family members for their expertise, um, to provide dinner at meetings, to you know get some initiatives off the ground. Um, to really get this going because we believe in the impact that a family advisory or, or a family partnership council can have. Um, so that's where we are with that and we're really excited to, to get that going. The chair of the family advisory council for CQCC is also a family partner in this task force, Michelle Wrench, and so we are thrilled to have her with us. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Colby to talk about the poll results. Everyone, thanks so much for joining. Um, in true family-centered uh, style, I am quarantining at home with two toddlers, and so my apologies in advance if they join um, the Zoom call at all, um, or if you hear Disney Plus in the background. Um, but I'm Colby Day. I'm a neonatologist. There it is. A uh, neonatologist in Rochester, New York, um, and uh, really excited about the work that's been done already and the things that are coming forward next. Um, we have our poll results from the questions that were asked of you guys. I don't know if you're able to see them yet, but it looks like we've had about 77% of the people on the call answer, which is fantastic. Um, sorry, Caroline, do you want to take over for a moment? I'm so sorry. <laughs> sure, no problem, Colby. Um, so it looks like about 50% of you have a family advisory or family partnership council, which is amazing. Um, and 8% of you are in the process of getting that going. So congratulations. Um, and then a little bit less, 30%, 37% of you have a family-centered care committee that's sort of a multidisciplinary committee, right? Um, and 14% are in the process of establishing that. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, we are excited to move on to the speaker portion. Um, and we do want to, to dedicate today's webinar um, to the NICU children of our speakers, Sophia, Max, and Grace. Colby? Yes, I'm back. Uh, we've got our Disney Plus fixed in the background. Sorry. So I am very excited to introduce Mary Beth Fry. Um, I know Mary Beth well from Vaughn. She's fantastic. Um, she is the NICU Family Care Coordinator at Akron Children's Hospital in Ohio. Um, in her role, she mentors and coordinates programming to support current NICU families. Additionally, she serves on a number of unit and hospital-based committees as the parent voice in her quality improvement projects. Mary Beth is the Vermont Oxford Network faculty uh, as the lead family partner of their iNICU and NICU collaboratives and experience-based co-design program. Please join me in welcoming Mary Beth. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I guess good morning also on the West Coast. So sorry for that. I'm um, in Ohio, so Eastern for me. I'm Mary Beth Fry, and I am going to be one of um, our three speakers today <clears throat> talking about um, creating and strengthening your family advisory and partnership councils in the NICU. Um, 
uh, Molly and I were consulting just a little bit um, when we saw each other at the Vermont for Network Conference this last week. Um, so, you know, there may be some repetition in our um, presentations, certainly because um, we're all doing similar work, but at all different sites. So please take away whatever it is that you can that's beneficial to you um, as you're doing this work at your own site. Um, and I will just say next slide, correct? Or am I able to do that? I'll just say next slide. Excellent, thank you. Um, so just a little bit about my site and, and where um, we're located. So I am with Akron Children's Hospital in Akron, Ohio. We are a level, level four regional transport NICU and a freestanding children's hospital. So um, I do find that that makes us a little bit unique sometimes in the work that we do uh, regarding patients and families, because all the babies that we um, treat here in our unit um, have mamas who are at other sites at the time of their um, initial admission. We are a 75 bed single patient room unit that is divided on uh, two floors and three wings. So in that photo right there, um, we are the top two floors, floor seven and six, and we do have um, three wings on those two floors. So we are quite spread out, although we are a lean site. So believe it or not, um, from a, a flow standpoint, we're doing better than we have before. But um, our patient population does include uh, premature and sick newborn babies, as well as babies who require our any of our surgical services. Um, and NAS or eat, sleep, and console treatment. So um, we do have two other local SCNs. We have um, another six sites um, within our region um, that are considered to be Akron Children's Hospital NICUs or SCNs. And then we also do um, take care of babies who are born anywhere within the region that may not have um, SCNs or NICUs close to them. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, I share all that information demographically with you because some of our patients come from, you know, an hour to two hours away, which sometimes can create challenges for families as they come to stay with their babies here in our unit. This is a picture of one of our single patient rooms. Um, and I am the NICU Family Care Coordinator here. So I have um, the good fortune to be able to support programming uh, with families who are here with their babies. Um, I did start that work as a volunteer uh, back in 2009, my NICU experience was actually back in 2004. Um, so some of you may be thinking, oh, wow, that's 17 years. You're right, I have a high school senior this year. That was 17 years ago when my actual NICU experience occurred. Um, how do I stay relevant? Believe it or not, and I'm sure you'll hear this from others as um, we continue our webinar today, that experience never leaves you. But the pain and the trauma of the experience um, heals a bit so that you're able to help other families um, as they continue the journey. So um, I did start as a volunteer um, and honestly didn't start until two years after I had my term baby, my son, um, who helped me to realize uh, what a traumatic experience I had in the NICU. Um, and it really also propelled me to want to help other families and support them. So um, over time, that volunteerism did become a paid parent position here in my unit as the NICU Family Care Coordinator fun. and the lead of our NICU-based um, Family Advisory Council. And I share that information because you'll see there are um, those of us who work in paid roles and those of us who work in volunteer positions. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of really pushing and furthering that paid position just for consistency. Um, uh, volunteers are phenomenal folks, phenomenal, um, generous folks who offer their time uh, to make the experience better for families, who make the outcomes better for um, physicians and families both, but it's just so important to really push for that consistency um, that can come with a paid position. Next slide, please. So um, at Akron Children's, our uh, Family Advisory Partnership Council is set up in this structure, this umbrella, I will say. So we do have a hospital-wide uh, FAC um, that is across all departments within our children's hospital. And then underneath that umbrella of our Family Advisory Council, we have smaller FACTS. And a FACT is a Family Action Collaborative Team. So that is a unit-based council. So in NICU, we are very fortunate to have that. Um, our pediatric ICU and our hematology units both have that as well. So um, over time, there have been ebb and flows of other units having these um, FACTs. But over time, at this point, we just have the three. Next slide, please. 
So our NICU fact, um, so our NICU fact, we are really fortunate in the NICU that this has been a longstanding um, group that was formed in 2005 by a group of really motivated uh, NICU graduate families and um, that came together. They had had their NICU experiences over time and they came together um, in collaboration with our larger FAC and our parent mentor coordinator so that they could create a hospital-based group. So um, again, at that time, they worked really hard um, as volunteers with the parent mentor coordinator to establish this group. So at the time, they have kind of taken on different roles. So some in our NICU fact um, are volunteers just specifically for that team, while others are also parent mentors. So um, and within that structure, we typically had a hospital employee point person who was kind of um, the go between for um, our volunteer NICU fact group and our quality improvement group in the NICU. Um, our NICU fact does still at this time report to our larger hospital-wide FAC. And um, those volunteers have participated in the Vermont Oxford Network over time with Akron Children's, which is great um, because again, Akron Children's has seen over time the commitment from Vermont Oxford Network to parents as partners in care. Next slide, please. Thanks. So, um, you know, again, uh, I share that timeline, that really brief timeline with you because um, the um, NICU fact has had, you know, a, a very long standing um, timeline of establishment. And along with that comes a lot of opportunities for projects and advancement. And, um, you know, we will also talk a bit about the ebb and flow that comes with having a long standing committee, right? So um, over time at the very inception of the group, there was a great deal of motivation and um, excitement over supporting families. Uh, at the time we were a 59 bed pod style unit. So, um, you know, we've been six years in our current space of 75 single patient bed rooms. So, you know, those changes over time have affected our, our family population um, as well as our FAC. Um, we have had, again, financial support from the March of Dimes at one time. We no longer have that. We now rely on donor funds and assistance from our capital budget. So again, that timeline um, and the changes that occur with it, uh, it's impactful. Um, we have and we do review and develop educational materials that go out to families. We do continue to try to have those celebration and support dinners. We'll talk about COVID in a little bit because that definitely had an impact on some of the work that we've done. Um, and we do a lot of encouragement of these folks being mentors. We are really fortunate at Akron Children's to have an online uh, parent mentor model. So if you were to go to our Akron Children's Hospital website, you could go under our volunteer tab and find um, a list of all our parent mentors that are available to families. Um, we do find that it's a really nice way for families to reach out and get the support that they need at any given time, as opposed to going through a coordinator and so on. So all the parent mentor profiles are, are on and available online. So we do really encourage a lot of our um, FAC members to become parent mentors as well. That way we can encourage group and individual mentorship, face-to-face um, -face phone calls and email communication. Um, again, COVID has had a bit of impact on that because um, some of our parent mentors are not vaccinated. And currently we require all um, volunteers to be vaccinated if they're going to come to the hospital. That said, it's just kind of propelled us to make sure that we're using other modes of communication, such as phone calls, email, and online platforms. Next slide. So um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the challenges and, and solutions to um, maintaining an, an FAC um, in the unit. So families and growing and changing and relocating over time. As I said, this, this group was formed back in 2005. Um, so, you know, many of the founding members of our group are no longer involved because, um, as you all know, uh, the NICU experience grows and changes and that ebb and flow over time, um, your time, your volunteer time may be, um, you know, repurposed um, from providing uh, feedback to NICU to serving on PTOs at elementary school to, you know, coaching on teams as children get older. So changes in families over time can affect your FAC. So it's really important to have 
active and ongoing recruitment and really clear terms of service. Um, I think that's really important for families to know as they're signing up for an FAC, you know, what exactly are they signing up for? What is the duration of time that they're going to be serving? Is it a year? Is it, you know, three years? How do, how do those cycles work with your FACs? And, you know, who is going off and who is coming on to, um, to your FAC so that you constantly have that nice pool of folks who can help your unit. Um, and again, terms of service, what is involved in your FAC? Are folks going to be required to come into in-person meetings? Is it going to be an online platform? Are they going to be reviewing and developing education? You know, what are the QI needs of the team? So all those things are really important to be upfront with families as they're signing up. Um, leadership changes can be a big impact to FACs. You know, when you're looking at whether it's your um, your physician leads, your provide any of your provider leads, you know, even your nursing leads, um, and how well is your FAC ingrained in the in the hospital culture, so that when those leadership changes occur, the FAC remains and the continuation of communication occurs. Um, and parent participation can be meaningful still in projects. Um, sometimes with leadership changes, perspectives change. Um, and it's just still really important for your FAC to continue to have meaningful and pro meaningful quality improvement projects to participate in. As folks are volunteering their time, it's important for them to be able to see the impact that they're making in the unit so that they um, have that satisfaction and they know that their time is well spent um, in helping families. That's really what they're there for. COVID, um, can't say enough, um, unfortunately, of the impact that COVID has had on um, everything with regard to families as partners and family-centered care. That said, I think it's also been a real opportunity for us to be able to leverage online platforms to continue the work. There are some FACs who were wonderfully, uh, just transitioned wonderfully from being in-person to being online. They were able to offer support to families online. Um, and that was really important. And I think you know, again, over time and whatever the lasting impact of COVID is on your institution, it's really important to just continue to use that online platform to continue the work and engaging families in the work. Um, honestly, for, for families who may have, um, you know, kiddos at home with long-term needs or even just recently transitioned home kiddos that they're not really wanting to take out in public, this is a great opportunity to leverage uh, technology to continue your work. Next slide. Um, and recruitment, um, you know, a lot of times people will ask, well, how do you, how do you recruit? Or um, I will often hear in work with, with families as partners, well, you know, I can't get families to participate in, in you know, an FAC or in quality improvement. They're just not interested. Um, I, I respectfully disagree. Um, I promise, promise, promise. There is always a family that is out there that wants to make the experience better for the next family. It's on us to make sure that we are extending the offer to engage them in that care. Um, so I challenge all of you, you know, talk to your bedside staff, those frontline folks who are there day in and day out with families. They can be your point people and they can give you a list of people that, hey, I think this particular family might be really awesome for your quality improvement or for your mentorship or for your family support work. Please tap into your bedside staff for, um, you know, recruitment ideas, going to events and things like that. Make sure you set up a table about your unit FAC at the family, at the family, goodness. Well, it feels like a family, right? At your NICU reunions. Um, at your fundraisers, at any of your events that you have for your hospital, make sure that there is a NICU um, FAC table set up so that families can say, hey, this is a great way that I could give back to the unit. Um, and also make sure that you're promoting the work of your FAC within your unit um, so that when, when those FAC members come back, they can see and experience the impact of that work, as well as um, current families who can say, oh, wow, you know, my hospital team is getting family feedback. This is awesome. They're doing work with families, not for families. And this may be a way that I can give back in the future. Um, this is also key, I have to say, please make sure and please work really hard to ensure that the membership of your FAC is reflective of your unit. 
I will be very transparent and say we have yet to crack that nut. It's it's a hard nut to crack. Um, we do have a patient population where we have a lot of families who um, are single parent families who may not have you know additional support at homes uh, to take care of children to come to meetings that are present. So it's up to us to continue to recruit families using that um, online technology, as I said. But again, just um, I know that we particularly need to be better as far as representing and um, putting that lens of equity on and making sure that, you know, our FAC is not just a bunch of um, middle class white women who are able to participate in volunteering, we need to really reach out to um, our other family members um, who have incredible insights in the work that we do and, and that are very much needed to have those voices. And I think that is all that I have. I'm going to turn it over to Molly Frost Wiley. Thank you so much for that talk, uh, Mary Beth. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Molly Frost Wiley, who is a NICU parent and a NICU family program manager at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. As a direct result of her experience both on bed rest for six weeks with her son to being in the NICU with her premature infant, Molly believes in the importance of community support and shared experience for NICU families. Molly provides a unique parent voice on multidisciplinary teams with the aim of improving the overall experience for families with infants in the hospital. Molly is the chair of the Family Advisory Leadership Committee for the Neonatal Quality Improvement Collaborative of Massachusetts Family Engagement Collaborative and serves as a board advisor to Project Sweet Peas, a national nonprofit that supports families of hospitalized infants and those who've been affected by pregnancy and infant loss. Please join me in welcoming Molly. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, and um, I'm so glad to be here and to be presenting alongside um, two amazing NICU, NICU parents. Um, I wanted to say it's NICU Awareness Month, so I know that we probably have a lot of NICU nurses on this call, and today it happens to be NICU Nurses Day, so thank you for all that you do. Um, you change lives every single day, and uh, so many of us think of you every single day when we look, when we look at our children um, and we honor our children, so thank you all so much. Um, Oh, hold on, my slides aren't advancing. There we go. Um, here's my contact information. I'm Molly. I'm a former NICU parent, and now I work in NICU advocacy. This is my contact information, um, and I'll also have it at the end of my slides as well. Um, I always like to center my talk around why I'm here. Um, this is my son, Max. This is the very first time I met him. Uh, he was born at 32 weeks after I was on bed rest for six weeks at the BIDMC NICU in Boston. Um, and I always like to use this photo because I don't remember... I don't remember this photo uh, being taken at all, but a very amazing nurse told my husband to take this picture. And on my son's first birthday, my husband gave it to me. And I, I just love that this, you know, look at that smile on me. And I finally got to, to touch him. I didn't get to hold him um, for quite some time, but I, this was a really, um, this photo means the world to me. So I always like to share it. Um, and here's some pictures of us during our NICU stay doing skin to skin, my husband doing skin to skin, and of course, uh, making our way out the NICU doors. Uh, and Max now is nine and a half. He's in fourth grade. He's healthy. He's doing beautifully. Uh, he's the big brother to a younger brother, Renzo. Um, but our NICU experience changed our lives. Um, and I work with families like ours now to try and make the experience a little gentler. Um, so I always like to center our talk around our NICU family advisory um, and NICU family engagement um, around philosophy of care. So in my unit, um, several years ago, right before the pandemic, we came up with a philosophy of care. And I actually heard about philosophies of care through similar QI networks um, like this one. So ours was co-created by NICU families for NICU families. And the goal is to just really show our parents our commitment to them being a part of the care team. So our, um, our philosophy of care reads, welcome to the Klarman family NICU. Your family is part of the care team. Here we value families and all the love and knowledge they bring and support the uniqueness of all families and cultures. Um, so the BI is a 63 bed level three NICU in Boston. Uh, we are not a surgical unit. Um, our rooms are semi-private. 
Um, we have a main unit and then we have a step down special care unit as well. And we are part of a networked hospital system. Um, and we are sort of the main level three and we get outborn um, and retro transfers to about seven different area hospitals. Um, our NICU Family Advisory Committee is about 25 members, and they inform all aspects of what we call our NICU CARES program. So I'm going to talk a bit about our NICU CARES program today and the work that I do um, it, with support of the NICU Family Advisory Committee and, and talk a little bit more about sort of how those roles intersect. Um, so we have a NICU CARES program. Um, it's an acronym. It's incredible how much the NICU world loves acronyms. <laughs> That's something that I've learned in my almost eight years in this field. Um, you guys really love acronyms. So of course, NICU CARES is an acronym, but these are some examples of the day-to-day -day work and, and what really what we do care about. So some of our alumni events, some of our support documents, um, the bereavement work and memorial service work, which is such an important piece of, of our NICU um, sibling work. Um, on the bottom, you'll see all sorts of brown bags, and this is um, sort of a painful reminder during during the pandemic when uh, our resources were very limited and we were not able to have our families in some of our um, shared family spaces. My coworker and I met very regularly to pack brown snack bags for our families so that they had a little nutrition um, and a little bit of, you know, just a little bit of sugar, a little bit of salt so that they could, you know, have help for that long day. Um, and then some of the fun events we do like photography. So our acronym stands for Compassion, Advocacy, Respect, Empathy, and Support. But what does that really look like? It looks like remembering to celebrate all the little things that happen in the NICU, all these beautiful, incredible milestones for these families that we get to be a part of. We have front row seats um, to the best and the worst days of some of these families' lives, um, and it's really important to, to honor that. Um, so our NICU CARES program um, was developed and it was developed and coordinates social and informational programs, um, and it's meant to help families during their baby's hospitalization. But additionally, our NICU CARES program helps families connect with other parents during and after their hospital stay, and to stay in touch with us as a hospital. So we involve our parents during and after their NICU stay in, in a lot of different ways. This is just kind of one, you know, one slide that shows all the different ways, but things from parents at rounds to our NICU family advisory committee, uh, NICU parents on our subcommittees, craft nights. We have an online um, support community for our NICU graduate families. We have different documents to help them be more involved in the day-to-day -day care of their infants. You know, not everybody is ready to be hands-on, and so it gives them some very focused things that they can do every day to help care for their infants. Um, we have a family integrated care, FI care um, curriculum and program on our special care unit that we're about to roll out to our main unit. Um, a lot of us just came back from Vaughn. We have ongoing and active Vaughn um, collaboratives, and we typically have anywhere between 12 and 15 parent advisors. Um, this year, I was the only parent who came, but in past years, we've brought some of our families with us to Vaughn. Uh, we do one-to-one -one virtual and in-person support. We have a NICU app that is beautiful. We have a music therapy program that I'm very hopeful will restart. Um, during the pandemic, of course, we had to get really creative and flexible about how we could engage our families. So uh, through the a donor program, we were able to secure some iPads and Kindles. We have a reading and literacy program. We have some support documents, alumni events, sibling supports. Uh, we have a beautiful meditation and relaxation um, program for our families through our pastoral care program. And of course, our bereavement and memorial service. Um, so similarly to, to Mary Beth's committee, I didn't realize they were the same year old, <laughs> but we formed our NICU Family Advisory Committee in 2005. So uh, our NICU Family Advisory Committee is the oldest patient and family advisory committee in our hospital at Beth Israel. Um, and it was created to increase programs um, through our NICU Cares for Families. Um, it was also created based on our um, family satisfaction surveys. I'm sure all of you are collecting data um, and doing longitudinal, you know, gathering of information about our your patient family and family satisfaction. Um, and so this was in direct response to some of the feedback that families really, there was a growing demand for parent involvement, right? Parents really wanted to give back. Um, and thankfully to our, um, our amazing leadership team, there was a really high value placed on that unique parent perspective. Um, and also a need for funding. Um, so sort of the inception of our family advisory committee um, 
was about finding opportunities for grateful families to be philanthropic um, and to give back. Um, and our family advisory committee has grown substantially since 2005. We now have um, anywhere between 20 and 25 members who attend our meetings. And I wanna highlight that one of the most um, significant things about our family advisory is we have seven different bereaved families who also participate, um, which I think really speaks to the level of care that we're providing even in loss, um, that our families want to stay involved and stay connected and improve the hospital experience for families that come after them. So the mission of our NICU Family Advisory Council is to touch the lives of each NICU family in a positive and lasting way. Our goal is to complement the NICU's outstanding clinical care and embrace the hospital's commitment to family-centered care with programs and initiatives that acknowledge and support the family in the time of crisis and to extend the relationship between the family and the hospital well beyond NICU discharge. So the NICU um, and FAC supports this mission through representative feedback on existing and future programming, um, facility and policy enhancements. This was um, most notable. We just went through a NICU um, redesign and renovation, uh, staff and family relations, development, fundraising, and other issues related to the needs of NICU families. Um, we also have um, 18 different subcommittees um, from our NICU leadership team. So we have three to four parents on most of our NICU subcommittees. Um, so this is another way for our families to be involved if they're not able to join our advisory committee. We often find opportunities for them to join these sort of subcommittees, which are more like a roll up your sleeves working group type of um, type of opportunity. So they meet monthly, um, but we only ask our parents to join about two to three meetings. They're now virtual for the most part um, or in person if they're able to sort of in the before times. Um, generally, we start talking to parents um, about their involvement a year post discharge, and we talk to all the staff who have um, who have worked with a family or who have been exposed to the family to see if they might be a great fit. So anywhere from their bedside team to their neonatologist, respiratory therapist, uh, as well as their social workers to to see if we you know if we think that it makes sense and if um, you know if we think that they they might be ready because certainly we're surfacing some complicated issues in some of these subcommittees and in some of our meetings and it's delicate and we want to make sure that we're not re-traumatizing our families, but also that we're, um, if they're ready to share their experience and if they're if they're able to, to, to take that expertise and that experience and to, to build better programming um, and to improve the lives of other NICU families. But how are we getting these folks involved? So that's um, sort of the, the meat of this, right? So we use a lot of different channels to connect with our families, um, everything from emails and phone calls, we have an alumni group online in Facebook um, that are, we have a discharge nurse, a dedicated discharge nurse who, who calls families and specifically says like, hey, do you wanna stay in touch? And then we're given those emails and we're able to um, communicate with our families and figure out which level of involvement they'd like to be. Um, I'm in a paid family position. I know I've seen some questions in the chat about that and I'd be happy to talk about that a bit more, but I'm a paid part-time hospital employed um, program manager within my hospital. Um, so that's another way that I engage because I'm able to be present at the bedside and build relationships with these with these families. Um, so we cast a really wide net because we know a lot of families will express interest, right? But, uh, you know, things like a pandemic happen. Um, and also we know as, as uh, NICU providers that Sometimes the NICU baby isn't the isn't the most critical thing happening in a family's life, right? There are so many different things that happen um, to our families at any given time. So we we really want to figure out ways that we can engage our families, but not add to their burden. Um, one of the things that I think is most effective, and I you know when I went to give a similar talk at the Gravens Conference earlier this year. Um, if you don't have a stay in touch document or someone reaching out to your to your graduate families to check in and to see if they want to stay in touch, that's like a really low lift thing that you can do to help you understand what their interests are and also to what degree they want to be involved. Um, if you're keeping something like that active and updated and if you can find a way to just get in touch with your families and ask them if they want to stay in touch with you, that's that's a good starting point. Um, 
we know that our families want to be really uh, a part of things. They want to be involved in our QI work. Uh, coming off of the heels of Vaughn, it's amazing to see what families can add to our quality improvement and to our advising. So, you know, you're giving them a really great way to help future families um, and give back after their experience. But it's all about relationships, right? Because if we're inviting families to come back and to share in a vulnerable way, we really need to build trust and establish connections and relationships. So this starts at the bedside during their NICU stay, and it lasts for many, many years, or in some cases, a lifetime. Some of the members of our NICU Family Advisory Committee have children of the, you know, have grandchildren who have children of their own. They've, you know, they've been sitting on our advisory committee since its inception more than 20 years ago. Um, you know, they really, this is such a critical part of their lives and it was such a touchstone for them that they want to keep, they want to be involved. They want to hear the way that, you know, especially, you know, some of our families who've been on our board for quite some time, the NICU has changed wildly. I know even for myself, my NICU stay was almost 10 years ago and the way that the care, that we provide care has dramatically changed. So it's it's really beautiful to see that, right? And to see how, how things are, are moving forward and how your feedback is being used. Um, but in order to get that feedback, right, it's really important to have trust and families need to feel safe and sharing the good and the bad about their NICU experiences. It's not easy to, to tell the people who have uh, taken care of your infant that, you know, Everything is beautiful, but there were some things that that could have been better. So when we're talking about, and then on the other side of it is when we're talking or disclosing clinical information to NICU families, sometimes it's really hard to hear about your child as a data point, right? Or when we talk about some of the more difficult topics, we need to make sure we're always using content warnings as they're appropriate. We always need to make sure that we're giving families a heads up if we're going to talk about something that may be, that may bring up some feelings and emotions um, for them. So we need to really think about the careful language that we're using um, in our NICU settings when we're bringing parents into this type of work. Um, it's really important to talk to NICU staff and the nurses especially about what projects you've got going on so they can see if they can think of any families that might be a good fit. And a lot of our families are still in touch with their with their day to day nurses, right? They they are updating them and you know now that they're home. So that's a great that's a great starting point. And then we also need to be really flexible. Um, a lot of our working families may not be able to meet regularly at 12 noon. Um, Zoom has been an incredible option for, for engaging families um, in sort of getting them involved in, in day to day and sort of making sure that their once a month commitment isn't too much. Um, something that we're trying to do in our hospital, but we haven't much success, it, but I know that it works at other units is some night meetings. Not everybody's able to meet during, during the day, but could you do, you know, even if it's one or two night meetings a year or night Zoom meetings, is that something that can happen? Um, also, are there opportunities for you to involve families over email um, or in a working group online? So just be flexible in the type of asks um, and be upfront about the ask. So what, what is the time commitment look like? What staff are going to be involved? Do you want to be forthcoming about that? And also, will they have a chance to connect with other NICU families? And do they want to do that? Compensate if you can. I know this is, you know, this is hard, right? Not a lot of our units even have a paid parent advisor role, but, um, you know, we need to be paying people for the time that they're giving us. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're writing a budget for a grant or you're putting a grant proposal together, add some time for parent participation for their time and for their expertise. Um, we're not current, currently compensating our NICU Family Advisory Committee, but we do offer them free parking and meals when they come in person for things. And for NICU projects, like our, you know, our co-creation of our Family Integrated Care Program, we had two co-leads um, who were NICU graduate families, and we offered them a, a stipend. Um, even if it's just some hospital swag, you just, you really want to show your, your appreciation for the expertise um, and, and for the time commitment, because a lot of these things can be very time intensive. Um, we know that it's really important to bring in um, all aspects of, of NICU families. So if you have families who are limited in proficiency or who do not speak English or are limited, um, using interpreters, having staff involved who speak those languages um, is really important to engaging those families. Um, and then transportation. I'm not, you know, some of you may have closer units, but we're a main level three unit and some of our families live hours away, different states. So um, providing transportation, parking, childcare if possible um, is really, is really helpful. 
And we know, as Mary Beth said, and I want to echo the importance, like we need to be recruiting in ways that represent and reflect our patient population. So we need to be prioritizing welcoming people from all different backgrounds. So race and ethnicity, but not only that, sexual orientation, family structures, gender, financial situations, physical and mental abilities, right? The experience of disabled parents is very different in an NICU. So are we, are we doing what we can to listen to their experience and also education level? Um, diversity and family structures. So are you engaging LGBTQIA headed families? Are you engaging single parents? And then culture and diversity. So again, families who are not speaking the dominant language in your unit, um, reaching out to them and finding ways to connect with them. We have some incredible family advisors um, in our Vaughn network who speak different languages. So it's always great to sort of tap an expert and see and see how they can help you engage. So of course, one of the things we were asked to talk about was the impact of our family advisory and COVID and parent participation and you know something that has sat with me. We, um, at the Gravens Conference earlier in March, um, someone I believe from the IPQCC, I think the, in, the Institute for Patient and, uh, I'm getting all my acronyms confused. Anyways, there was a really powerful quote that said something along the lines of, um, the pandemic did to NICU parents what, uh, what the pandemic did to NICU parents, what the asteroid did to dinosaurs. And I think a lot of families are really feeling like we have a lot to come back from. Um, and that I think resonated with a lot of us NICU families and people in roles like mine. Um, you know, everything moved virtual. So, you know, on the fortunate side, at least for our family advisory committee, we moved to virtual quarterly Zoom calls. And surprisingly, we found there was increased participation. Um, our family caregivers were on Zoom providing here back providing feedback and hearing updates about the NICU during COVID um, in an increased way. But our subcommittee, sort of our working groups that met more regularly, we saw that participation sort of drop off. So less parents are available to join the monthly calls. We saw a lot of Zoom fatigue. I'm sure we're all experiencing the same. Um, and we, you know, we really had to do things like get really creative with emailing for feedback for documents and engaging them in different ways. And we're 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 still working our way out of that hole to be, you know, transparent. I think, you know, Mary Beth was saying sort of something similar. It's this is hard work and it's not easy. And when it works for a little while, something may happen and you'll have to kind of start over again at the ground floor. But um, I'm grateful to have a community of family advisors who are enrolled similar like mine to pick their to pick their brain. So know that if you have questions and they're building a family advisory, you don't have to do it alone. There's tons of us who are doing it too, who, you know, we may not have all the answers, but we can hopefully find you and work together to, to build these programs. Um, so that's what I've got for today. I just wanted to say thank you again. Here's my contact information. Um, and here's some pictures that bring me some joy. Um, it's it's not easy, um, but I think it's so important. And you know, I think our families appreciate this work so, so much. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Molly. I think we're gonna have uh, several questions for you in the chat once we get to the Q&A session. So thanks so much. Um, I'd like to also introduce our next speaker, Jennifer Johnson, who hails from my own institution, University of Rochester. Um, so uh, when you report for the news for 17 years in one city, the name TV News Lady is hard to shake, but it's one Jennifer Johnson embraces after a career as a television news anchor. Journalism is what brought Jennifer to Rochester, New York, but three years ago, she started a new career inspired by her late daughter, Grace. Grace was born very sick in 2011 and was not expected to survive. But because of the exceptional care she received, Grace lived almost 17 months. You learn a lot being the parent of a medically fragile child. Jennifer began advocating on behalf of patients and families and soon realized there was so much work to be done in this area that it could be a full-time job. Now, as the Director of Family and Community Outreach at the Children's Hospital that cared for Grace, UR Medicine, Gallo Center Children's Hospital, Jennifer is working to bring the voices of families with diverse backgrounds, diagnoses, outcomes, and experiences into the decision-making process at the hospital. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Thanks so much, Colby, I appreciate it. Hi, everyone, thanks for your time. Yes, I'm here on the East Coast as well, and I'm hoping that my youngest remembers when she gets off the bus today to go to the neighbors, so <laughs> thinking that my doorbell won't ring, but if I have a, a Colby moment, if you will, <laughs> please please bear with me. And I just wanna thank you guys too for you know dedicating this talk to our NICU kids. That was really beautiful. Um, Grace would be turning uh, 11 this coming Monday. And so any opportunity to, to, to see her voice and see her name on the screen is welcomed. So uh, thank you. I needed that you know sort of right about now. 
Um, as uh, Colby mentioned, I'm the director of family and community outreach, and I want to stress that there is no mention of NICU in my title. I am not NICU specific, and quite honestly, I <laughs> wondered if I was really right for this talk, um, since my approach is, is very, very different. But then I kind of thought, you know what, maybe someone will benefit from a very different approach. So bear with me, here we go. <laughs> uh, my responsibilities in this job are really threefold. Again, growing that army of diverse families to, to give feedback and support one another. And of course, that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, but I'm also out in the community representing the hospital through speaking engagements, community engagement events and, and fundraisers. And again, having been a journalist for 20 years, I still love to tell stories um, and, and, and I still embrace the media. And so I also work with our medical staff to help them feel comfortable working with the media and social media because you know we need educated voices on those platforms now more than ever. Um, and I also work with our, our, our staff to create medical education videos like the one in the lower part of your screen there on the right. Um, this is on our NICU website about how to fortify breast milk at home, um, which was identified by our NICU families through discharge surveys that uh, Dr. Jeff Myers, who I believe is on this call today, um, one of the things that was important to him. And so identifying that on surveys with that, well, let's do something about that. Uh, and so we created this you know, simple video, it's about five minutes long, and families can watch it before they leave, and then they can access it on our website once they're home. So some of some of what I do, and so again, some of the work that I'm talking about is um, actually just a third of, of what I do. Um, so as about our hospital, um, we're part of the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. Um, our children's hospital upper right there is an eight story tower. Um, it connects in a few places to our adult hospital. We used to be stuffed into the adult hospital, and then a few years ago, we built this beautiful tower. Um, as for the NICU, it is our largest unit, 44 private NICU beds in our tower, as well as 24 beds in the adult hospital. That's like a, a, NIC down, a NICU step down unit, but most of those are individual family rooms as well. We're often at 100% capacity or more, and it's the only level four NICU in our region. So we kind of take all the kiddos on the unit. Uh, if you could, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so how did you build the Family Advisory Council or Family Partnership Council programs in your local NICU? Well, I didn't. <laughs> um, maybe I'm helping to rebuild um, them, you could say. So um, I want to give a huge shout out to our social work clinical manager, Carla, Carla Levant, who I believe is on the call today. Um, she is a family-centered care pioneer and champion at our institution, especially in the NICU. In fact, what you're seeing on the left here is a poster that she presented in 2012. Um, Carla and her small team, if I'm if any of them are on this call and I'm leaving you out, forgive me, um, but they really moved mountains to get things going at our children's hospital. And by 2009, um, they had created a family advisory council to gain parental input uh, for the NICU's policies and procedures. Um, some of their successes, yes, I agree, Colby, she is amazing. Some of their successes include um, expanding uh, parent visiting hours and allowing parents to stay in unit during rounds and shift changes establishment of a parent advocate and peer support volunteer position. Um, yes, volunteer. We rely heavily, heavily on those at our hospital. I am paid, but so many of the people that we rely on for this work are volunteers. Uh, improvements in discharge planning and follow up and uh, parent participation uh, on hospital committees for planning and quality. Uh, so Carla and the small team built the, this great foundation, you know, for this work at our children's hospital, even bringing in uh, Beverly Johnson, who we just mentioned from the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care to really take their work to the next level. And they were off to an incredible start. Uh, the momentum for this work um, kind of hit a little bit of, I don't want to say rocky ground, but sort of paused just a little bit when our larger hospital system that we're a part of, you know, really seeing the importance of family centered care, wanted to take over that care and sort of bring it system wide. Um, don't get me wrong, a ton of the incredible work that Carla and her team um, established continues and, and carried on like a that uh, family advisory council that, that, you know, continues to have representation, representation from all across the children's hospital, including the NICU. Um, the NICU advisory council that there is one, but to be honest, in my role, I don't know as much about that. I know um, Dr. Myers and, and Dr. Day are here, and I think Morgan Kowalski is here as well and can probably answer a lot more about the status of the NICU advisory council. 
Um, but another thing that, you know, Carla inspired a strong, strong core of parents who have that lived NICU experience. They remain uh, dedicated to our hospital. Um, Pre-COVID, they would uh, come on the unit in person and cold call, um, visit, visiting with families, hosting family dinners once a month and hosting scrapbook nights on the unit. It really is uh, a robust effort and, and my hat off to Carla and her team and everyone who helped build this great foundation that I got to um, help build on top of. Um, but that time that I sort of mentioned when leadership of the effort was a little bit in limbo, um, sort of allowed then a, a little, little bit of this work to grow organically, if you will, um, which is really impressive, um, but not necessarily structured. Some, some pockets grew much better than others. So if you try to get a snapshot of what was happening in this realm across the children's hospital, that was kind of hard. Um, and we know that tracking this work and producing data uh, on, on it to measure its impact is important. Um, we know keeping track of the parents involved in this work in case, for example, the Joint Commission ever comes and, and says, hey, what are the qualifications of these folks? We know that's quite important, which actually happened this week to us. Um, and we also know that you know keeping track of the parents and, and how they're feeling about this work, again, it can bring up a lot of feelings about their own time there. Um, keeping track of them and seeing how they're doing um, because we know that they're such valuable resources and we're really trying to tap into their input now more than ever. ever. Um, all of that is, is, is easily said uh, to, to track all of this, but not easily done, especially with limited resources. So if we could go ahead and change the slide, please. Um, I had actually no idea about any of this internal history that I've just shared with you. Um, I didn't join the hospital staff until 2019. So yes, I'm experiencing a little bit of imposter syndrome right now, <laughs> having just heard our last two speakers. Um, but I, what I knew was um, after having a baby in the NICU in 2011 for 72 days and bringing her home on all sorts of medical equipment and managing her around the clock care at home, and then having her pass away at a year and a half was really, really hard. Um, and I say that as someone who is so privileged to have, you know, a very supportive and dedicated spouse, a safe home, reliable transportation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all of those supports. Um, I say that as someone who is privileged to be able to call up the head of our hospital at the time and tell her my thoughts on what went well with our care and what didn't go well with our care and actually to see some changes happen from that conversation. And I say that as someone who was privileged to have gotten to know a lot of our hospital families and hear their ideas for change uh, all across the hospital and not just the NICU. And honestly, I was, I was happy in my other job as a journalist, but I had such an urge to do something with all of this information. And I was able to brainstorm this all into a, a full-time job and um, working with the head of our hospital, who a new head of our hospital who came in 2018. Again, we were able to put together um, this, this job in part because he's very encouraging of family-centered care. And by the fall of 2019, I was actually in place doing that job that we created. And that was actually the first time I was hearing the term family-centered care. I didn't realize that there was a term for something that um, I was finding was my passion actually. Um, so what were the next steps um, and what were the challenges for all of this? Well, after I started in this newly dreamed up job, um, Carla and I connected and tried to regain some of that momentum of um, that she and her team had had really um, you know, planted the seeds for and really re-energized the effort. Uh, we identified that it'd be great to get more family advisors on the overall family advisory council. We met with quality improvement teams and identified it would be great to get more families on the QI committees that already existed or were on a list to get started. Um, same for our public relations uh, group, managing a uh, marketing group and advancement teams who wanted more families who'd be willing to show up and, and share their story. Um, and same for our new bereavement coordinator who wanted to infuse more uh, parents into work, the work that she was doing. So if we can go to the next slide, please. We named this effort to incorporate more families into our work, the Family Connection Program. And in late January of 2020, <laughs> we brought a bunch of families together and told them all the ways that they could engage. And many of them signed up to engage in multiple ways. And this was really a dream come true to me to really harness the power and insight of families. And then, of course, you all know what happened next, right? 
COVID, <laughs> COVID was like, yeah, not so fast, right? So many of the engagement opportunities, of course, were put on hold. You know, families couldn't necessarily come in and our staff was so busy, especially those NICU nurses that Molly gave a shout out to earlier, um, were so busy just trying to figure out how do you care for people in a time of COVID. Uh, but as devastating as COVID has been, it really gave us the wake up call and honestly the time to realize that we needed to build this program in a way that it could exist virt virtually and actually a few other ways that have been important to me as well. And I'm gonna talk more about that um, in just a moment. But first I wanna go over our engagement opportunities as they currently exist and are presented to all of our families, including our NICU families. So if you can go ahead and change the slide, please. So it might be kind of hard to read on this screen, um, but I put together this chart and actually there's a few other pages that list out not only the description of the opportunity, but the paperwork that's required, the training work, the training that's required, the time commitment that's involved and, and who are the contacts for a lot of these work. Uh, but quality improvement family advisor, you know, we have a CLABC uh, committee going, a NICU handoffs committee going, employee safety and patient behavior that we have parents actively on right now. And I think they're seeing the, the fruits of having families involved. Um, the next section there are our buddy programs. Um, we actually built this during COVID as a way for families with lived NICU experience who were at least two years out from that experience to be matched with a family that was currently in the NICU. Um, and these connections were meant to be virtual. So we said, you know, connect by text, phone, email, or a platform like Zoom, kind of like whatever works for you guys. And this has been a really big lift with now a 19 page handbook for our buddy mentors to follow as they onboard, but it has really caught on and is being replicated by our trach and ventilator program, as well as our G2 program with many more units interested in, in starting a buddy program, um, including our bereavement coordinator who I'll talk about in just a moment. But our third graph there sharing with the public. Um, you know, whether it is, again, speaking at a, a fundraiser like a golf tournament or a gala or simply sharing a picture of your child who has a G-tube for our uh, hospital social media as we celebrate, you know, G-tube awareness month or something like that. Um, a lot of families are, are wanting to share their story to, to help promote the good that happens at our hospital. So um, that's an opportunity for families to engage. Um, bereavement advisors, I mentioned the future bereavement buddy program. Um, this group is, um, at our other advisors are doing things like reviewing and, and standardizing what units give to families when a child passes away in the hospital, like a memorial box, like if you lose a child in the NICU versus the PICU, um, there might be different things that families get. So we'd like to, they're looking into standardizing those things. Um, we have our family advisory council and family support there on the right. That I mentioned that strong core of NICU parents um, who, you know, cold call on the unit and host those monthly dinners and scrapbooking events before COVID. They are, they've missed this work. They are itching to get back in our hospital um, physically and are, and I think are just getting the green light now. Um, but we want to really expand this concept of support out of the NICU into other units. Like, for example, in our hospital, um, a lot of our oncology patients have great community supports or our cardiac patients have great community supports, um, but maybe other patients like, I don't know, burn patients or orthopedic patients, maybe there aren't as many um, community supports. So maybe we could create those supports for them through, through involving families. Um, so those are the engagement opportunities and we're in the process right now, literally right now of adding sort of this chart um, to um, our website so that everyone is aware of what these opportunities are and what it takes to be involved. And if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so what did, you know, COVID teach us about how we should, you know, build and, and run this program? And I think that they should exist in these ways. Um, really, what's important to me is that so much of this can run virtually. Um, and that's both internally and externally. And what I mean by that is, you know, externally, even after this pandemic is, you know, hopefully over one day, fingers crossed, right? Um, connecting virtually instead of in person uh, may be easier for families with medically complex kids or medically fragile kids, of course, or families who live, you know, far away and can't make that drive into the hospital for a meeting. Um, internally, 
many of us doing this work, myself included, are working from home. Space is at a real premium at our hospital. So the office that I used to have, I don't anymore at the hospital. I'm talking to you from my basement. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to stay on the same page being in a lot of different places when you're really doing cross-disciplinary work. Um, and so this has been a huge challenge because we already have a focus on meeting industry standards for the training and uh, paperwork required of our families. Um, while at the same time making it not too much of a burden that that is a barrier for them to participate. So figuring out how that whole system can work and then how we can actually all work virtually. Um, it's been a big lift, but I think one that is important to, to gather more voices of more families. Um, this program, of course, needs to be HIPAA compliant as we talk about all of these, you know, paperwork, paperwork, uh, papers flying back and forth. Um, it needs to exist in an equitable fashion and it needs to reflect and meet our values, for example, um, diversity, equity and inclusion training. So a little bit more kind of about what that means. Um, the whole process of getting family advisors into our system will soon start online. So yes, we do want definitely recommendations from staff, but we also don't want it to be a barrier. We want anyone to be able to find us and be able to say, hey, I want to be a part of this. Um, so this is a red cap form on the left where people can, you know, give us their basic information, um, reflect on their lived experience and, and how they are actually interested in engaging in our system. Um, and this also allows us to, to be able to track them within our system. And shout out to Dr. Myers who helped me create this a long time ago because that red cap can be a beast. <laughs> Uh, the Canadian Premature Baby Foundation, um, it has this introduction to NICU peer support training that is online and in video form, and it is absolutely great. Again, Dr. Myers found this as well. Um, you can access it anytime, and it covers empathetic listening and the importance of HIPAA um, to the hallmarks of our program. Um, we have HIPAA document advisors signed to go along with that as well. Um, and what do I mean by it existing in, a, in an equitable fashion? Well, not everyone, you know, working from home like I am, you know, has access to a printer, for example. So someone sending someone an attachment to print and fill out and then send back by snail mail may exclude some people. So um, it's also extra steps for already busy families to print it, fill it out, find a stamp who has stamps anymore, go out to the mailbox, right? Um, so we're trying to create forms that can be filled out online instead. You know, for example, our public relations team, um, they need parents and guardians to sign this very specific HIPAA form before they say do an interview with the media sharing their child's um, health journey or sharing a picture on our social media pages. So we're working on making this form electronic and looking to see um, if DocuSign might be an option and that, that checks all of the privacy boxes. Um, how about diversity, equity, and inclusion training? Um, many workplaces, mine included, require DEI training for employees, right? Um, and we think it's important to bring this to our family advisors in a form that is tailored to them. You know, a lot of us have to sit down and do like those hours long stuff. Well, volunteers don't have time for hours long stuff. So we created our own by working with our Office of Equity and Inclusion, as well as a grateful mom who happens to be a DEI consultant. And our hope is that this one hour virtual authentic, authentic advocacy and unconscious bias training is helpful as our advisors support a family that may be very different from them, um, or as they may be advocating for the diverse and beautiful families of our hospital through a place on a committee, for example. Um, I'll be honest, not everyone embraced this uh, unconscious bias training at first, um, but I'm happy to report that our first training session over the summer was a real success and we actually have our second session happening next week. Um, so then feeling then setting up a system to track all of these trainings and all of these paperwork and honestly right now I kind of feel more like a, a virtual structural architect than someone who is actually connecting with humans on a day to day basis so i'm excited to finally get all of this done and transition to actually. Um, you know connecting with other parents and seeing how we can support um, parents face to face. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, did you have financial support and how are you planning to sustain this? Well, I'm calling for backup. <laughs> I'm calling for backup. Carla is my partner in crime on a lot of this and we rely heavily on a former NICU mom um, who's a volunteer and an absolute saint um, to help with the day-to-day -day logistics and keeping track of all that paperwork I talked about. Um, I have asked for a family connection program coordinator to be funded through our hospital's budget, which my boss, who is the head of the hospital, supports, but we're currently in a hiring freeze, so that's not an option. 
Uh, another approach, um, our NICU, which has a lot of representatives here, is um, really looking to kick our family-centered care, uh, care into high gear. So we've asked a NICU-focused donor to fund a position that will sort of head up the NICU-focused components of the Family Connection Program that I've talked about and many other NICU-focused projects, and we're hoping to hear back on that very soon. Um, as for logistical support, we've connected with an office that um, tracks our on-site volunteers, like our in-person volunteers. And even though most of our Family Connection Program advisors are engaging virtually, that office still has the capacity to track people. So we've been able to rope them in and help, help with some of this paperwork. And so how do you get buy-in from staff and physicians to engage in family-centered care? Um, that's a good question. Um, I am wrapping up, I promise. Um, we have some staff that are all about family involvement, like Dr. Day, for example, Dr. Myers and Dr. Day, thank you for the invite to talk today. Um, but honestly, we do have other staff that I worry about when it comes to engaging with families, as sort of mentioned. Quality improvement, for example, can be looking at um, you know, where your strengths aren't, which aren't necessarily easy to hear. Um, and so human nature may mean that we become defensive, and I worry about that when it comes to staff and parent advisor interactions. Um, because it takes a lot for a parent or guardian who maybe has been hurt by the system or doesn't trust the healthcare system to, you know, choose to engage back into the system. So we really need those voices now more than ever. So we need to make sure that everyone's on the same page about the importance of this family-centered care and family-centered care from all types of families. Um, we're also working on having Bev Johnson to come back to do a grand rounds and talk about, you know, why is it important to have family-centered care? Why is it important to have diverse voices? Why do we need to hear this feedback and where does our hospital stand um, in regards to this work? And hopefully by then in November, it'll be our chance to highlight this Family Connection program, which will hopefully be all online by then so that everyone knows it as the one place to go for families to start their engagement, engagement journey in our hospital. And finally, on my last slide, like Molly, I just want to highlight the kids in our hospital and say thank you because yes like you this brings me joy too thank you wow thank you all so much <clears throat> thank you mary beth molly and jennifer for these amazing presentations and for your time and of course to um to colby malathy and caroline for organizing this amazing session um i've just learned so much from all of you um i'm ashwini lakshman and i'm the the chair of our education and outreach committee for cpqcc pquip and here with me moderating our um our Q&A is Courtney Broles, who's our Director of Quality and sort of the heart of all our CPQCC endeavors. Um, so let's start with um, some questions we, we gathered from the chat as well as from registration. Um, and please feel free for our audience to add uh, more questions into the chat. We may not get to all of them, but at least we can have a record of um, some of the, the topics that you're interested in. So I'll hop right into it. Um, uh, feel free, Molly, Maribeth, um, Jennifer, to take this one. Um, what recommendations do you have for a council at a small, low acuity NICU since the patients may not be staying for very long? I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, yeah, I actually think, and this is something that we've all talked about, I think, as family advisors as well, that um, the, the experience of the short stay NICU parent, um, it, while it may be very different from our longer stay families, I think that those families um, have such a different experience and are in such a, they're, they're in crisis in a totally different way because they either got to the finish line or they got close to the finish line and all of a sudden everything changed. Um, and so they, they really are caught off guard. And so I think you know, one of the ways that we struggle in my unit to engage our late term um, and our late preterm families, uh, we have an online portal called My NICU, and it's an incredible resource. But signing up for it is a huge barrier for this 20% of our families because it's sort of an acknowledgement like, if I sign up for this, that means that I think I'm going to be here, right? And so I think it's so important to recruit those voices and to even just reach out. You know, I don't know if you have a discharge coordinator or somebody um, who, you know, even if you add some protected time, just a short amount of time to reach out to those families and get their feedback on what may have made their experience better in their NICU. Would they, you know, I think that a lot of our, um, our late preterm families would really benefit from mentors because it's really scary in the NICU, no matter who you are. And one day in the NICU is too many. 
Um, so I do think that it's so important to engage them. And I think having somebody who can reach out, whether it's in a parent advisor role or somebody on the staff that can create a network of them, making them feel welcome um, in the alumni community, I think is huge. I know that uh, we always, you know, in, in NICU communities talk like, there can be sort of a competitiveness about whose baby is sicker. Um, and you really just want to make sure that everybody feels open and welcome in all of the spaces. And our NICUs are now increasingly seeing, um, you know, a patient population that is term, you know, we have cooling baby, things like that. And so we really want to make sure that, you know, it's, it's about supporting everybody. Um, so I do think that it's really important. You can start by just reaching out to them and asking them what they want, right? Because it's not about us telling them what they need. It's about us saying, what What did you need while you were here with us? Thank you, Molly. Hi, everybody. I'm Courtney. Um, great to be here. And thanks to you all. Next question was really a, a hot topic um, as people submitted this question. And although all three of you did discuss this question, I think we need to drill down a little bit deeper here so that we can really help teams be intentional and successful with this. So what tips do you have for recruiting or promoting diverse family representation on a council? I know Mary Beth highlighted this in terms of reaching out to all NICU families to highlight various voices. Molly um, really gave a great example of the use of interpreters, providing concrete um, you know, transportation for families, and then wel welcoming people from different backgrounds. And Jennifer, you did touch on it as well. So how can we really help folks concretely with this? I think I'd like to start by saying that um... I haven't actually done a lot of recruiting yet, in part because I want to make sure that the environment that we are welcoming people into is ready to receive that. Um, uh, you know, I think we've had maybe knee jerk reactions in the past few years to go, oh my gosh, let's make sure our groups are diverse. Um, and we can say that, but being ready to hear it and being ready to have an environment that really truly is welcoming to everyone. Um, I think if you were to, to do that too fast, you would just find yourself maybe doing more harm than good. Um, and then you're back, not even at square one, you're, you're back even before that. Um, so uh, again, I worry about, you know, making sure that our staff realizes the importance of, of these diverse voices and um, letting our families who come into our system realize with this unconscious bias training that this is important to all of us um, and it's a hallmark of our, our community. And so no matter where you are in that journey, we do wanna at least want, make sure you have this baseline um, because it's important for people to realize that everyone is welcome. And so I haven't even really gotten to the recruitment phase. I've more just been trying to set the tone to make sure it's, it's one that's welcoming. Jennifer, I think that was so well said, and I think it's really important to to ensure that, you know, when you do get to the recruitment phase, when we all get to the recruitment phase, that we're not just filling token seats. It's got to be meaningful work and the follow through has to occur. So I really commend you for, for working on the culture and the prep on the front end of that. It's very important. Thank you both. Um, there is a question from our chat about uh, about stay in touch documents. Um, if you have um, some examples and um, what does that mean for how we can do that better as um, units? So I think that was probably a reference to, to something that I mentioned in our talk. So we've actually phased out our, our stay in touch document um, because we have a we have a dedicated discharge nurse now who calls families and checks in and asks, you know, how they're, you know, if they have appointments and follow up, things like that. She checks in, but she also asks if they would like to stay in touch with us. Um, and then she asks for the best way. So we have usually an email contact, but that's definitely we have a form that I could that I, I'd be happy to share. Um, I can send it to, to Mothi and to Colby to, to share with the group, but we, you know, just something that sort of says, and I think, um, you know, we had talked about at some point also like, and I think I see, I think I see a question in here from our NICU nursing director. I think Kathy's here talking about this as well. I think there's opportunity to even like say like, are you interested in subcommittee work? 
did, you know, what, what about your experience, you know, would you like to give back about, like, are you more interested in craft night and giving back in that way? Or do you want to talk about chronic lung disease? You know, so um, that's, I think, a really important piece of it. And I do a bit of that in our alumni community. We have an, um, so like when I recruit for families, um, I let them know what the kind of commitment is. I say like, this is a group that's going to meet on Tuesdays once a month from three to four. There's going to be respiratory therapists. There's going to be, you know, doctors. There's going to be nurses. There's going to be social workers and sort of let them know what the landscape is a little bit so that they can decide what their comfort level is and what, if they're able to commit to it. Um, Cause I think one of the hardest parts about recruiting families to these types of subcommittees is you're like, are you interested in being part of it? And they're like, yes. And then you're like, great what are you interested in? They're like, I would really like to do, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, great, that's on Thursdays. And they're like, I actually work at nights on Thursday, you know, or whatever the case may be. So you really want to make sure that you're clear um, about what the time commitment is, because they're going to, you know, not everybody is able to to stay up to those commitments. And if they want to be um, a part of it, but they, you know, they may not be able to, may not fit into their schedule, or it may only fit into their schedule for a year or two. And so sort of re-recruiting, I just um, was reaching out to our, we have a neonatologist who's the director of our family engagement, Emily Whitesell, who's um, a part of this committee, but couldn't be here today. And she and I were just talking, like, we need to re-engage families again, you know? Um, it, so I think that's, that's a big piece of it and, and ask them where their interests are and what they'd like to give back to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, the, the session has just flown by and we have, you know, lots of questions that have come up in the chat that we'll post to our Padlet um, and maybe can continue the conversation there. Um, so again, thank you so much, Molly, Jennifer, Mary Beth, and of course, um, Colby, Caroline, Malathy for all your hard work. Um, on behalf of CPQCC, we just wanted to emphasize our commitment to um, families as a foundation of high quality inclusive NICU care, which was a topic of our Improvement Palooza um, in 2022. Um, this is our QR code to join our CPQCC mailing list. Um, and we look forward to uh, continuing this work with, with all of you. And again, just so, so pleased to see all the engagement here today. Um, so thank you. And I'll turn it back to, um, to Caroline, uh, Malathy, and Colby. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwini. Um, I want to thank our amazing speakers, Mary Beth, Molly, and Jennifer again for your great talk. And I hope uh, everyone um, ready to take this into action. And so our task force webinars are usually every other month. So except we add, we have one in October, just to add it on this topic. Thanks to Betsy um, for being vocal about including term and late preterm family partner. Um, so that's the reason we created this webinar and it's October 13th and it's gonna be late preterm and term family partner speakers. And as well as uh, um, Dr. Patterson is talking about uh, um, providing support to non-birthing NICU partners. So if you are in listserv, you probably received the calendar invite already. If you are not on, so you can just join our listserv and uh, or you can just uh, fill out this evaluation survey about this webinar and we uh, appreciate your feedback and uh, that's how we can get better at um, uh, improving on our future webinar. So thank you. Thank you for joining and we will see you all on October 13th at 11 a.m. Thank you. Bye -bye.